Good evening. It's good to see everyone out this evening. What a blessing it is to be here. Like preacher said, it's a blessing to be anywhere. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Brother BJ, would you open us in prayer, please? Amen. Amen. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the friend of sinners. Amen. I'm, I'm a sinner, saved by grace. Praise the Lord for that. Let's stand and get our All-American Church in. We'll turn to page number 313. What a friend we have in Jesus. 313. <laughs> All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear You would turn to page number 356, sweet hour of prayer, page 356. Got a lot to pray about. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from a world. Of care and bids me at my father's throne, make all my wants and wishes known. Seasons of distress and grief, my soul. Faithful name. 
snare till from Mount Pisgah's lofty height I view my home and take my flight <clears throat> this robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to see Until then, folks, <laughs> praise the Lord. Amen. One of the Greek words for prayer in New Testament is proskuneo, and it means to prostrate thyself before the Lord. Amen. Don't have any trouble doing that. He's a lot bigger than me. Yeah, big money. Welcome, everybody, tonight. We have some folks from Ohio, I understand. We're glad to have you folks. You make yourself right home with us. Amen. Appreciate the good sunshine, don't you? Amen. And sun's shining, your body's making vitamin D, they tell us. <laughs> they tell us a lot of things, folks. A lot. <laughs> but in any event, I'm glad I'm here, and I know this. I know the good Lord made the sun for us. Yeah. Amen. Turn to me the Bible tonight to the book of Matthew, chapter number 10. Matthew 10. Verse number five, Matthew chapter 10, verse five, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is is at hand. Bless this book now, Lord. Thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Now you understand this is early, early, early on in the ministry of Christ. He's calling his disciples, these apostles. He's calling them. He's uh, giving them a command. He's equipping them and he sends them forth. Now don't you turn to John chapter number four with me, gospel of John chapter four, and hold your place there in Matthew 10. John chapter number four. And verse number four, John 4, 4, he left, get, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, and he must needs go through what? Samaria. Now, hold on. He just told him back here, Matthew chapter number 10, and verse number five, do not go into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. Now, if you're a Bible believer, how many are Bible believers? I'm not looking for mistakes, and I'm not looking for conflicts. I'm looking for wisdom. So why do these differ? Why in one place he sends them and says, do not go to the Samaritans. The other place, he himself comes to Jacob's well, which is at Sychar. There he finds a Samaritan woman about noon coming to draw water from the well. Well, if you'll notice, it's the Gospel of John for one thing. The Gospel of John is not about the kingdom of heaven that we read about in Matthew 10. And the Gospel of John deals with more people than just Jews. The Gospel of John is universal in its application of the Gospel. Not just Jews, not just to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But there's something else going on here. And that is that the kingdom of heaven that is preached in Matthew chapter number 10 has run its course. And now obviously something has changed. And if you understand something like that, and may not understand all the issues involved with it, but understand that simple principle that you, can, that you don't have to make passages of the Bible conform with each other. Maybe they're written to different people at different times. Right. And that's exactly what's going on here in John. Right. John. Now look at, uh, look at uh, John chapter number 4 and verse number 22. John 4, 22. He says to the Samaritan woman, you worship you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the who? Jews. And it hasn't changed one bit, because the Lord Jesus Christ was of the was a son of David, a son of Abraham, yes. the tribe of Judah. Yes. 
So we read here plainly, salvation is of the Jews. Well, what about today, preacher? It still is. Salvation is not of the Muslim. Salvation is not of the Hindu or all the rest of the religions on this earth. How they fit is God Almighty's business. But the fact of the matter is tonight, we have a Bible, we have the truth, and it helps us understand who we are in this world. I give unto thee the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom, he said. He said, whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He said to them in the book of John, chapter number 20, I send you forth. He breathed upon them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. He said, whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whosoever sins you retain, they're retained. Then we come to 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. A man had his father's wife. The apostle Paul says, turn him over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. But, but, that his spirit may be saved. That's eternal security. Amen. Of course, I just quoted a few to you to help you understand that the Bible is a marvelous book. But you've got to get it in context. This is why the Bible said, comparing Scripture with Scripture, study to show thyself approved, and all of these passages that have to do with it. Now, who was a Samaritan? Well, the Samaritans, as commonly said, are half-breed Jews. It's really not that simple. They certainly did have Jewish blood. We firmly believe that. But we also believe that they had an admixture brought in there, people planted in the land to take away their total identity and from Assyria and so forth. And so therefore, it caused a big problem with the Samaritans. They had their own temple. They had their own priesthood. They had their own Pentateuch. The Samaritans literally were despised by the Jews, not just uh, just to keep the difference from them. They 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 were despised. One of the charges they laid against the Lord Jesus Christ, they said, said we not that thou art uh, a Samaritan and uh, demon-possessed, devil-possessed? Yeah. In other words, they put a demon-possessed person on the same level as a Samaritan. Yeah. So they were hated. And the Gospel of John and the New Testament, or more than one time, goes to the Samaritan and uses the Samaritan as an object lesson of faith and so forth. And he even personally comes to a Samaritan woman. So what's going on here? What, 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 what does this help us with? They rejected everything but the Torah. So does the Kairite Jew. They, they, the Kairite Jew today respects, uh, uh, refuses to accept rabbinic Judaism. What's rabbinic Judaism? It's Judaism that is taught and led by rabbis. Yeah. And why? Because they don't have a temple. We'll get into that a little later on. They don't have one yet. They don't have a temple, therefore they can't offer sacrifices. They have synagogue. In Jerusalem they have what's called the Great Synagogue. 30, 40 years ago we had writers coming out saying, well, that could be the temple. It could stand in for the temple. No. No. Synagogue was never a temple, never will be a temple. There's a difference completely and entirely. So what we have here is a a lesson that that he's going to teach us as he deals with this Samaritan woman. Now, here's one of the great lessons we get from it. Turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 12. Genesis, chapter number 12, and verse 6. Genesis 12, 6. Now, we know who Abram is. He came out of Ur of the Chaldees. All right? Abraham, he, at this time he's Abram, but he's called Abraham. The fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is added, hey, later on, which makes him Avraham. But now he's Avram, father. He comes from east in Ur of the Chaldees, and he travels west to Jerusalem. He comes what's called the Fertile Crescent through the Valley of Mesopotamia. He comes from there into Israel, into the land that God promised him in chapter 12. Look at this. In Genesis chapter number 12 and verse number 6, he passed through the land into the place of Sychem or Shechem or Shechem, Unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. So the first place an altar was built in the Holy Land was built by Abraham. And, uh, and it was built by Abraham uh, based on a covenant relationship that God had yeah. with him. He's come out of the land, he's come out of, out of a foreign land into his land, and God binds himself in a covenant. Notice where it's at. It's in Shechem. 
The Hebrew word Shechem means shoulder. In other words, something that holds you up. Remember when we read about Sychar, the book of John chapter number four. There's Jacob's well at Sychar. Where is Sychar? Sychar, Shechem. It's right at it. And therefore, it's quite a remarkable lesson we're going to learn about this woman who comes to the well. At Sychar, you can look visibly and see Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You can see them, the twin mountains. And you all know that Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim is where the children of Israel stood when they read the law to them. And half on one and half on the other. Ebal means fool. And Abigail was married to a fool. Yes, amen. <laughs> and Gerizim is, it means bless them. And so the, so the, so the uh, uh, Samaritans built a temple on Gerizim. That is where they worshipped God. They had their own priesthood, which was not the priesthood of Aaron. They had a separate priesthood. Folks, there can only be one priesthood. Only one. There's only one high priest. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't have another. But here's what's important about this. Two times, two times here in Genesis chapter number 12, Abraham builds an altar. Look at verse number 8. And he removed thence into a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord twice. And notice where he builds it. The first time he builds an altar at Shechem. That's where Jacob's well is located. The second time he builds an altar, notes carefully, it is between Bethel and Hai. Bethel in Hebrew simply means the house of El or house of God. Hai literally means a, rub a rubbish pile or garbage pile. And if you'll remember when Joshua, we went back in this just a few weeks ago, came into the land and Hai was a town, and he said after he had defeated Jericho, we'll just send a few thousand down, we'll take care of them. Well, they didn't take care of them because he didn't pray. And so the trash heap over, the trash heap did them in. But here's a lesson to learn in this thing. This land that's called Shechem is a land of shoulder that holds up. You see, a covenant relationship with God means that God's holding something up. Now, you make a covenant relationship with the Lord. No covenant that you've ever made with God was anything more than a temporal covenant because you're not going to be around 100 years from now. But when God makes a covenant, it's an eternal covenant. It cannot be abrogated. When he said, this is the blood of the New Testament, that's the blood covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will never cease to exist. Why? Because it is based upon an endless life, the life of Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews, an endless life. So it's an endless covenant that cannot be done away with. So when God Almighty makes something, he does it that way. When he swears an oath, he does not swear it by a human being. We're here today and gone tomorrow. So he must swear it by somebody higher than a man. Who does he swear it by? Himself. <laughs> There's none greater. So God binds himself with an oath by his own character, by who he is, and says, I will do such and such a thing. This is what's happening here. God says, Abram, this is your land. I'm going to give it to you, making a difference who's here. Like, for example, right now we have what's called Palestinians. That's a, that is a misnomer. There is no such thing. But we have people who call themselves Palestinians. We have what's called the Dome of the Rock and then Alaska Mosque. Just a few days ago, Jews were led by the police up to the top of the Temple Mount. The Arabs, the Muslims in that country, literally get get fighting mad if a Jew comes up on the Temple Mount. And when Arafat was the head of the PLO, he tried to, he tried to, he tried to change history and say that the, uh, that the, that the Temple never stood on, on the Temple Mount. And of course, when they went underneath the Temple Mount a few years back, they found all kinds of things that connected this Temple Mount with Israel, with the Jews. And you know what they did? They took bulldozers in there. They took bulldozers into an archaeological site. The world should have been screaming. Right. If, they, if, it, if, if, if it meant anything, you don't take a bulldozer into an archaeological site. No. And they did. They bulldozed it, put it in a big, huge pile outside Jerusalem. And the Jews went out there, and the rabbis went out to that pile, and they started going through it and pulling the pieces thousands of years old out yeah. of it. 
what they were trying to do was to completely do away with the identity of Israel and that Temple Mount. Folks, get ready. Right now, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is the hottest place on this earth. It's hot there. It's ready to explode at any minute. But in any event, these people, these Samaritans, uh, were definitely a, uh, a hated people. If you'll remember over here in the book of uh, Nehemiah, chapter number 2 and verse number 20, when they came back, Sanballat was refused part in the temple. He was refused to have any part of it. And over here in the book of Nehemiah, chapter number 2 and verse 20, that said, you have no part, you have no right, you have no inheritance in Jerusalem. Amen. So you don't belong here. This is going to be rebuilt by Jews. Yeah. Remember that uh, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel, and Ezra, I talked to you before just a few weeks ago, yeah. were three very important people right. in bringing Israel back out of Babylonian captivity. Yeah. Very important people. Yeah. Nehemiah built the wall. Yeah. Zerubbabel in the book of Zechariah built the temple. And then Ezra restored the priesthood. Right. So you have to have the priesthood if you're going to have Israel. And you can't have a priesthood without a temple. Right. And so the temple is built and back they come. These people are already in the land. People like Sanballat and, 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 uh, and the others. And they were, they, were, they were doing everything they could to stop yeah. the building of the wall and then the temple. Right. And they got a stay order for a while. But then it, was, uh, then it was opened back up and they could come in. And they finally finished the temple of the Lord. Now that's called the second temple. The Jews to this day still call it the second temple. Herod the Great, you know who that is, the so-called Great. He, all he did was embellish upon that temple to, re, to build larger the Temple Mount. And he did it for political reasons. He didn't think, care anything about God. But it was all so he could, it was all to appease the Jew and impress Rome. So he did this. But the Jews still call the Temple of Zerubbabel the second temple. The reason we identified is because now they're talking about the third temple. That's what's important, the third temple. So Jacob's well was there. Shechem is the shoulders located between Gerizim and Ebal. This is God's covenant with Abram was placed right there at Jacob's well. Remember now, God's covenant of the land to Abram was made at Jacob's well. Now, at the time, I don't think there was a well. It's hard to trace back the well, who dug it, and when it started. But 2,000 years ago, there was a well. And I'll tell you right now, it's still there. I've been to that well. And it's quite a remarkable thing to walk into that, I think it's a Greek Orthodox church, and walk up, and there is a well. And there's no question about it. That well is thousands of years old. And you know what? If you want a drink, they'll put a bucket down there, pull it up, and you can have a drink of cold water out of Jacob's well, a well that has not run dry. So when, the, so when this woman, this, this uh, Samaritan woman went to the well, she, she knew where she was going. She knew what would be there, and it was faithful. And the Lord Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who you're talking to, you'd ask of me, and I'd give you living water. Yeah. So the well here at Jacob's a type of the living water. Yeah. Note carefully, though. It's at a place where it's based upon the shoulders and the strength of God. Yeah. In between a place where choices have to be made between blessing and cursing. Yeah. And it goes all the way back to Abraham, who's my father and your father, yeah. if you're a believer in Christ. Because right. he's the father of the faithful, yeah. every one of us. Because I don't know of anybody in the Old Testament had more faith than Abraham. No. He, followed, he followed the light he had. And right. the more he followed that light, the brighter it got. Indeed. Amen. The more he followed the light that God gave him, yeah. the brighter it got. Yeah. And we're indebted to Abraham for what he did. So Shechem was the shoulder. He built two altars. We told you about them. And then he left Ur of the Chaldees. Now this is important. Look at Genesis chapter number 12 and verse number 6. And Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, or Sychem, unto the plain of Morad, of the Canaanite was in the land. And the Lord appeared to Abram, said unto thy seed, Will I give this land? And there builded he an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain, and watch this, on the east of Bethel, and pushed his, pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. 
And there he built it an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. The writer of Genesis, which of course is Moses, said that when Abram prayed unto God, he turned his back on Hai and faced Bethel, which is the house of God. It never changes. From east to west is how God comes. When he leaves, he goes from west to east. And you see this in the Bible. Look what he says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. Matthew 24, verse 27. Matthew 24, 27. You know, there's a lot of good people out there. They are. They love the Lord. I don't question their motives. But they try to stick the church in the 24th chapter of Matthew. Folks, we're not in there. We don't belong there. It's had nothing to do with the church. This is purely Jewish. Look at chapter 24, verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. See that? There it is. And it's more than once. It shows up over and over and over again. Go to the book of Ezekiel chapter number 10 and verse number 4. Ezekiel chapter number 10. Verse 4. Now you remember that the glory of the Lord departed from the Old Testament temple. Here's it tells you how it happened. In the book of Ezekiel chapter number 10 and verse 4. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub. The cherub is the one who is in the Holy of Holies. Yeah. He is an angelic being and he's a mystery. But he is certainly a real spirit being. And the glory of the Lord went up from cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. See this? To the entering end of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. All right. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. The Lord leaves from the cherubim. All right. Stands at the threshold of the house. Here's the glory of God. Now look at chapter number uh, 11, verse 23, Ezekiel. Verse 22, it says, Then the cherubims lifted up their wings, and the wheels beside them, and the glory of God of Israel was over them above. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. Notice what he's doing. He's leaving, and he's going from west to east. And notice something else. He pauses. He pauses when he comes to the threshold. He pauses when he leaves the city. He pauses on top of the Mount of Olives. It's almost as if he's crying. His heart's broken because Israel has apostatized, and the glory of God is leaving that place. Now, folks, when the glory of God leaves it, there's nothing left sacrifices and brick and mortar and the buildings and all the rest of that. These are nothing in the world more than things that point to Him. An awful lot of people today, they're happy with the stuff that points to Christ, <laughs> but not Christ Himself. Amen. You see? Amen. It's, like, it's like the fiery serpent. You remember the fiery serpent? You bit them, okay? All right. That was, it's like a nahash, okay? A fiery thing. Back there in the book of Genesis, this serpent that came to Eve, this brilliant, uh, shining creature. So it, in the wilderness, bit the people. All right, Moses, God said, Moses, put a serpent on a cross, a stick, lift it up, and all they have to do is look. That salvation was pretty simple, wasn't it? Look. And when they looked, they lived. Well, here's the problem. They took that thing after it was surface, its purpose was served, and they put it in the temple. And they continued to lift it up and look up to it and pray to it. And it was called Nehushtan. The, yeah, it was Nehushtan. It was, it, was, it was one of the most derisive terms that could be used. It was a godless idol now. At one time it had been the serpent that they looked to. Why, why is the problem? The problem is that snake worship Serpent worship is as pagan as it comes. Amen. Amen. It's called ophiolatry, from the Greek word ophis. 
And Ophis is a serpent. Have you noticed how serpents now are starting to rise back to the top again? Oh, yeah. I, you know something, folks? I'll be honest with you tonight. I'll have to confess a weakness. I've never had a desire to make a rattlesnake my friend. <laughs> Just don't care about it. <clears throat> or a copperhead or, or a Burmese python. Got these old boys down there in Florida and in the south. They're python hunters. That's how they make their living, apparently. They do. The thing will stretch itself out, plumb across the road. And they get so much money for each python they kill because it's an apex predator. And the only thing down there that's, that can fight with it and possibly beat it is the alligator. And so here we are, ophiolatry, worship of the serpent. Now, they worship the serpent, but what God knows is that the serpent represents something greater than just a piece of wood or a stone or whatever. It represents the devil. It represents Satan. And the Bible says plainly in the Word of God, it says the things the Gentiles offer in sacrifice, they offer to devils. Right. You say, well, if it's just a bunch of dead stuff. No, it's not dead. No. It's not dead. It's like taking a Ouija board and watching the letters move around. Well, it's just a toy preacher. What about the spirit behind it? Right. Anytime you get yourself into something and start delving around, messing around with something you should leave alone, you can pick up a spirit from it. You have a natural immunity to this stuff. But once you cross that barrier, you can pick one of them up. And what you're watching on TV, what are you watching? What are you watching on, on the Internet, YouTube? What are you watching? You see, you better be careful what you're doing because you can get yourself in trouble real fast. There's a spirit world out there, folks. And you ought to know that as a Christian because if you're born again believer in here tonight, the Holy Ghost indwells you. Glory to God. Isn't that wonderful? You've got the Holy Spirit. So he turned his back on Hai and he faced Bethel, house of God. Why was he doing that? Because the curse was in the east and the blessing was in the west. So he left Ur of the Chaldees. He left east and went west. The tabernacle entrance was from the east to the west. That's not a coincidence. Their temple entrance was from the east to the west. The approach to God inside the tabernacle was east to west. And then in Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 27, as I read to you a few minutes ago, let's go back and look at it again. Matthew 24, verse 27. As the lightning cometh out of the east, shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Yes. Isn't that something? Yes, it is. Now, what's going on? Well, I want you to go over here to Ezekiel chapter number 43 and verse 1. Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 1. Ezekiel 43, 1. I got you running all over the Bible, amen. Well, that's good. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 43 and verse 1. Afterward he brought me to the gate, yeah. even the gate that looketh toward what? The east. the east. Why? It's called the eastern gate. And we've got songs written about the eastern gate. I've been to Jerusalem. I've been to there. I've been to the very spot, the eastern gate. Of course, the wall is built over the old gate. A Muslim understood this. He said, I'll take care of that. So he builds, he, so it is, he creates a graveyard. He puts all these tombs right in front of the eastern gate. Like you think that's going to stop the Lord. Yeah, right. Listen, the Lord Jesus Christ could appear at that thing, rise, and every one of those graves bust wide open, and he could walk right through that thing to the Holy of Holies. Amen. So he's the one that has the power of life and death in his mouth, in his word. As the Father hath life in himself, even so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. The life of the Father is the eternal, absolute life of an almighty, eternal being. The life of the Son is the life of a resurrected man who came into this world and lived a sinless, perfect life. And on the third day, rose from the dead by his own power because sin could not hold him. And that's the life he gives us. Resurrection life. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah to God. I'm about getting ready. I'm getting happy tonight. I'll tell you the truth. This, this, is, this stuff is good. Chapter 43 of Ezekiel, verse number 2, Behold, the glory of God of Israel came the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters. The earth shined with his glory. It was according to the appearing of the vision, which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision I saw by the river Chebar. I fell upon my face. And the Lord, the glory of the Lord came, watch this, 
into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward where? The east. See that? From the east. Now, some, one, one man, I don't know if I'll tell this or not, because uh, if you're from California, we love you. We're not trying to be mean to anybody. <laughs> but one man said that every good thing that ever happened to this country came from the east. They came across. They came to places like Plymouth and so forth, Jamestown. They planted and they built. And now in my generation, I've watched some garbage come out of the west. Amen. Haven't you? Oh, yeah, I mean garbage, folks. But that's not to say that that's the only place. I mean, go up to the Hudson River. There's plenty of garbage up there, too. Lake Michigan, there's a lot of garbage there, too. Lake Erie, there's plenty there. There's a lot of garbage. The whole country's been overrun with garbage. There's plenty of it, no question about it. But as the lightning flashes in the east, and you see it in the west, so shall it be of the coming of the Son of Man. Amen. Do you know that when he left this world, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was with his disciples. And he ascended to heaven. The angel said, why do you look? Stand here gazing into heaven. The same Jesus is taken up from you. So come in like manner. Then a couple of verses later it says, Then returned they from the mountain called Olivet. He ascended from the Mount of Olives. All right. He left this world going east. See? He left it going east, just like the glory left it going east. When he comes again, he's coming from the east down to the west. Amen. And he will come. That's no coincidence. He left it. He'll come from the east. Zechariah 14, verse 4 says that when he turn, returns, he'll put his feet down on the Mount of Olives. And he'll split in two. Bust right asunder. He'll bust it right in sunder. And the Bible says half of it goes toward the east and half of it toward the west. Yep. Isn't that something? So why does it need to bust asunder? Because there's a river going to be flowing through it. That's why. Where's that river coming from? From the Temple Mount. Right. It's going to come up out of the Temple Mount. It's going to be the same water that went to the Pool of Siloam when the rich man, I mean the, uh, uh, the Pool of Siloam when the, when the blind man, he said go wash in the Pool of Siloam. The Samaritan woman was saved at the place where God manifested his power and the place of a choice. And it was there that Abraham and all that followed him made their choices. And now here at Jacob's well, she's standing in the same place that Abraham stood and she's got to make a choice. And the Lord said to her, salvation is of the Jews. Yes. Which one did she choose? You remember what she said? Come see a man that told me all things that ever I've done. Is not this the Messiah? Is not this the Christ? Sure, she believed. Absolutely, she believed. And, of course, she believed and she was saved. So, in the New Testament, you've got the Good Samaritan. In the New Testament, you've got the Leprous Samaritan that was healed of the ten. He came back to give thanks to the Lord. Then the Samaritan woman at the well. All these are pictures of the different kinds of faith. But in John chapter number 4 and verse number 24, the Bible says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Do you think a dead spirit can worship God? You see, you're not worshiping him in your soul. You're worshiping him in your spirit. Your soul may be party to it, but the spirit is what reaches up and touches his spirit. And if your spirit has not been born of the spirit of the living God, yeah. then you worship you know not what. Right. Right. Salvation is of the Jews. Exactly. And tonight when we gather together or any other time and all around this world are many millions of our brothers and sisters, they worship in spirit yeah. because their spirit has been regenerated, right. been born again, born anew by the spirit and power of Almighty God. This is a little thing I wanted to leave with you tonight. In John chapter number 9, I, would, I keep going back to that thing because it's one of the most remarkable passages in the New Testament. He's born blind. The disciple said, Master, who sinned? Did he sin or his parents sin? The Lord said that the glory of God may be made known. Yes. 
And so he made spittle mud from the dirt. Okay? The water came from the Son of God, and it made mud. The dirt is cursed. It represents the curse. Cursed. Cursed to the ground. From dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. He put that curse on his eyes. Then he sent him to the pool of Siloam. And at the pool of Siloam, he, dealt, melt, dealt, he kneeled down, and that water that was flowing up out of the temple mount, filling up this pool, he washed the dirt away. He washed the curse away. And when he did, he came seeing. The story doesn't stop there. The Pharisees and religious leaders of Israel began to question him. What's going on? Don't you say anything good about this man, Jesus? And he said, I don't know who he, who he is, but I know this. I was blind and now I see. That's right. Now, here's what's important about this. They kicked him out. They ran him off. The moment they did that, the Lord Jesus Christ hunted him down. Why did he do that? Yeah. Why did he hunt him down? Why did he find him? I'll tell you why. Because he was no longer part of Israel right. to be dealt with according to Romans chapter number 11. He was now an individual out on his own. And being out on his own, the only hope he ever had would be the light that comes to him, the light that he could see. He either receives it or rejects it. And, of course, he did receive it. Now, this is where we are today. Israel is blinded, but there are Jews out here with their eyes. If you want to get a good Bible study, get on the Internet and log on to where a bunch of saved Jews, Messianic Jews, are studying the Bible. And you'll be amazed and how they, through their tradition and so forth and so on, that they know things that, that we, you know, we, we were Gentiles without hope in the world, worshiping idols and stone. We don't have any, we don't have any uh, spiritual ancestry, but the Jews do. And so uh, salvation is of the Jews. And so he, he, Lord Jesus said, Believest thou in the Son of God? Who is he, Lord? I might believe. I that speak unto thee am he. And he, of course, believed. He yeah. believed. And at that moment, he was saved. Now I'll close with this tonight because I just want to keep, I want to bring it up because we'll deal with it in a later lesson. There's going to be two temples. All right? This just came in the news. Rabbi Tuli Weiss published this April 18th, 2022. This is brand new. He says that the public opinion in Israel today is no longer looking at people like Gershom Solomon and the Temple Mount Faithful as a bunch of, a bunch of left wing or right wing uh, fanatics. They're beginning to open up and warm up to the idea that maybe we do need a temple. Maybe we do need a temple built. And here's what Hamas says about it. They don't like it. Hamas is terrified that after close to 75 years of statehood, Israel will begin turning its attention to the place where God chose to establish his name. In fact, each year, more and more Israelis take the dangerous risk of ascending the holy mountain under the hostile guards of Jordanian officials. And they're doing it. You just get on the internet, they're doing it. The Jews are going up on top of that mountain. I've been up there. Every time I went to Israel, I've been up there. I went down into the Dome of the Rock one time, all the way underneath it. Went to the Dome of the Rock. And uh, it's, quite a, it's quite an experience. It's, it was like going into, in, into the Great Pyramid in Egypt when I went down this long shaft. And I got about halfway down, and I said to myself, what, in the, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you wanted to run, there's nowhere to run. And we went, I went down into that, into that pyramid, folks. It was quite an experience. But you see, when these Jews come up on that Temple Mount, they know who they are. They can tell by the way they dress. They hate them. They despise them. And they, and they rock them. They, they, they beat them. And to get them off of that Temple Mount, well, more and more and more Jews are ascending to the top of that Temple Mount. And the reason they are is because they know there never will be peace with the Muslim you can talk about all land for peace all you want to, folks. Wake up. There will never be peace. Never. 
And they're beginning to say, we want our identity back. Right. We want our temple. Yeah. And they're going to build it. Now, folks, this is something that's important. If we're here to watch them start building that temple, yeah. get ready. Yeah. Because it says in the book of Daniel, it says in the book of Second Thessalonians, that he will walk into the holy of holies and proclaim himself to be God. Yeah. What holy? The, that temple, That's right. the tribulation temple. And when he does that, when he goes in there and declares himself to be God, you got your antichrist. Yeah. Amen. You'll Amen. know who he is. Amen. You got the man. You'll know it. And that temple will be destroyed at the second advent of the Son of God when he comes back. According to the book of Zechariah, he's going to build his own temple. That's right. And the temple he builds will be the millennial temple. Yeah. A temple that will stand at least a thousand years. So watch it. Watch it tonight, folks. Watch it. Yes. See what happens over there with that temple and the temple mount. All of these other things that may not seem to have any, any connection with it whatsoever may be bringing it all together. Oh, yes. This thing over there in Ukraine right now, what Russia's doing, out of the clear blue, Iran, all of this stuff. It's like a chess game. You, yes. It's a puzzle. God knows exactly what he's doing. And when he gets ready, he's going to bring it together. And there's going to be a temple over there on that mountain. Yeah. And I think, God Almighty, yeah. I'll look at it as I leave. Yeah. See you later, alligator. I got nothing in that temple. Because I'll be going up to where that altar yeah. and that ark of the covenant Praise is God. located. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless my dear brothers and sisters. Thank you for the time we have together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. amen, amen. Folks, remember Keith T. Kell tonight. He's over at UT Hospital right now. Where is he? Oh, all right, brother. <laughs> you got back, all right. Well, what did you find out? Did they tell you anything? Well, I'm going to schedule for pulmonary rehab Okay, rehab. Okay. Okay. Okay, from COVID? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, I told her, hey, I'm a long haul somewhere else. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You leave the body behind. <laughs> right. We're leaving. Amen. God bless you, brother. Well, it's good to have you here tonight. Amen. All right. Anybody else have requests? Yes, sir. Okay, brother. All right. All right. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Is it Watchtower? No, it is actually, the top part it says protection technique visualization by Mark A. It says use the following visual, visualization daily in your meditation to protect yourself and others from your I am self and light body. <laughs> right, okay. And it's talking about we give thanks to our Father, Mother, God. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sophia. Yeah. It's talking about aliens on the back of it. Okay, right. They all go together. Yeah, that's some wild stuff. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. That makes me want to take up an M14 there, brother. Yes, sir. That, that's, that's, uh, oh, man. Somebody needs to tell Putin he's going to hell. He needs to understand that. That's exactly where he's headed. All right, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Amen. 
and Victoria had a problem with that. And yeah, and, and, it, and we got her, got her straight, straightened up, yeah. And so the younger they catch it, the better it is, too. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. All right, brother. Amen. Okay. Yes, sir. Sure. Yes, sir, brother. Some folks, some folks uh, physically suffer more than others in this world. I mean, that's been my observation. All right. Any anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay. Good. All right. We pray for you. Amen. Yes, ma'am. All right. Amen. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. <coughs> yeah, amen. Amen. Jay's about six seven, six eight. He's a big boy. I'm sure his legs have carried him for quite a while. Let's pray for him. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh huh. Oh, she did. Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. She was diagnosed today with it. Okay. Amen. All right. Remember her in prayer. All right. Anybody else? unspoken quest tonight well I was going to have an altar prayer for brother Takel here but here he is so brother would you lead us in prayer tonight
Let's see here. We've got a special. Where is it? Uh, Josh. Josh Crabtree. As I was uh, practicing for for tonight and getting ready, I had heard a song that uh, popped up on my Spotify playlist over the past week, and um, there was a whole bunch of Southern gospel artists. I guess a couple of years ago, took some of uh, Fanny Crosby's lesser known songs and did a CD together, <clears throat> and uh, this one is called Calmly Resting in the Lord, and, um, and it's just been a blessing to me the past, past little bit, and, um, and actually I'm thankful that you're here, Brother Keith, that I think that this will probably be a blessing to you too, so just pray for me as I try to sing it. <clears throat> a journey day by day filled with laughter and with pain but I know that he is with me through it all when with clouds my path is dim storms of doubt arise within I find refuge in the shadow of the cross Savior holds me by his mighty
Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and we'll let you go, folks. We'll meet uh, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock for Sunday school, and worship at 11. Father, thank you for the time we've had together in your holy word. Thy people, those that will listen to this later and those that heard it uh, stream live tonight, I pray, I pray that you bless the word as it goes forth, and it will not return void. Thy name I pray. Amen.